It's mind pump time. All right, so we're excited in here because the giveaway is exciting. Here's what you get if you do the following and you win the following. So leave a comment in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel and turn on your notifications. If we like your comment, we'll notify you and you'll get free access to, ready for this, the Prime Bundle. Maps Prime, Maps Prime Pro, great for improving mobility, getting rid of pain, making your body more stable. If you're a trainer, extremely valuable programs. So you'll win those incredible programs by doing what I said and doing it well. Also, we got a 50% off sale going on right now. Two very popular workout programs, MAPS HIT, which is high-intensity interval training, and MAPS SPLIT, which is a bodybuilder-style split workout program, both 50% off. Uh, if you're interested, head over to mapsfitnessproducts.com and use the code DEC50 for that discount. All right, here comes the show. Hey, look, there are no dangerous exercises. So in terms of exercises, none of them. Are dangerous. Oh, you're gonna get, get blasted. blasted. Wrong. <laughs> you know what? You know why I, I want to say that because uh, oftentimes you'll hear people say things like upright rows are bad for the shoulders, or if you do a lateral with your pinky higher than your thumb, that's bad for your shoulders, or if you do a Lat squat this way down behind your neck. Yes, and the reality is, if you have the required control, stability, and mobility in connection to doing that exercise, it is not a dangerous exercise. What makes it dangerous? is your body and your lack of ability to control. And you mobile. couldn't help yourself. We were supposed to explain all that. Yeah. Now, <laughs> <laughs> now, there's, there's, this is actually an interesting conversation because there's there's more to that. Uh, you know, I remember being a, a, a trainer in the, the first like five years or whatever, and you start to build up a little bit of knowledge and experience, and then you go through this phase where you kind of probably think you know it all or whatever. And, and I, and I see this a lot and I see this uh, uh, exaggerated in social media life, right. Or world or oh, whatever. Yeah. And, uh, you see a lot of trainers and fitness people that like to, uh, point out people doing, you know, quote unquote, stupid exercises, mm -hmm. you know, oh, it's a stupid exercise or, oh, it's a dangerous exercise or, oh, they shouldn't be doing that. Or that's, they're an idiot or like calling out people that are exercising when you don't even know who that person is. And I fell into that trap. Of being like that, you know, seeing, you know, knowing, knowing a, a little bit enough to get me by, to teach others, to get in shape and knowing what, what, what is uh, considered dangerous for most people or exercises that don't give you a lot of benefit for most people. And so all of a sudden you assume that when you see this person in the gym that's doing this exercise, you go, oh, that's stupid. And oh, the, the, mm -hmm. you pointed out, but the reality is I have no idea what their desired outcome is. Mm -hmm. I have no idea what they're training for. It could it could have massive application for what for what they're trying to accomplish. Yeah, and it may be ridiculous for 99% of the population, but how dare I look at this movement that I think is ridiculous and silly so long as they're performing it in a controlled fashion and they're not going to hurt themselves. And I think mm -hmm. that the, the a lot of trainers jump to that conclusion that like Oh well, that's a for a great example of this is the the Jefferson curl. Yeah, right. So if you've ever that seen has it, to that has to be the one exercise that looks like oh my gosh, you can't do that. You right. If that. you see yeah. a Jefferson curl and you've never seen one before, right? If you if you see that for the first time and you and you're a trainer, it kind of breaks a lot of the 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 fundamental rules that you've been taught mm -hmm. uh, uh, for good mechanics for bending or hinging over, right? But that, that specific exercise is, is not supposed to be like a deadlift. It's supposed to be a different movement, and it, it is, it's, it's intended to strengthen and, and challenge all the muscles surrounding around the spine and your core, and if done properly, can be a, a very phenomenal exercise. Yet, I know that most people, I probably wouldn't train that, but I, I, I look differently at movements like that that in the past I would probably go, or even here's another one. Uh, look at LeBron James doing a quarter squat, yeah, or yeah. you know, or or anybody for that matter. LeBron James is someone famous, but see someone doing a quarter squat, and then right away we want. I mean, there's dedic there's pages yeah. dedicated going ass to grass to talking shit about these people that are doing movements like that when you don't know what this person does for a living, you don't know what adaptation they're they're going after. So who are you to judge whether that's a good or a bad movement? Yeah, I think you if you're experienced, you can watch someone do an exercise and notice that. In many cases, they oh they don't lack, they lack the mobility they lack the connection. Right, I could do that for for I'd say the most part maybe not every single time, but for the most part. But but that being said, there's a lot of exercises that people write off.
because they say, don't do that, it's dangerous. The, the truth is, if you own the exercise, it's not dangerous. If you can do the movement well, there's nothing dangerous about what that movement is, and that's really it. So it, the, the blanket, you know, bad exercise, good exercise, or too dangerous, don't do it, nobody should ever do that. And Jefferson Curl is my favorite yeah. because it's literally you know, rounding your back, you're bending <laughs> yeah. over, you're... But you know that, that you know that exercise was a staple among uh, gymnasts. So, well, gymnasts and Soviet era wrestlers. In fact, they did the Jefferson wow. curl with a zercher position, so they were bending all the way down, and it was a rounded back, and then round, yeah, and then as long all as you can up. generate tension and you can maintain stability and control and strength in that position, like it's a valid movement. And that's the thing; it's like the prerequisites to a lot of these movements they need to apply, but. Uh, as far as a judgmental uh, trainer that's in the gym, I do find there is there's instances where you'll see somebody with terrible form performing a, a certain type of movement where it, it it does warrant a conversation in terms of uh, well you might you might not want to keep applying uh, this technique to this specific exercise yeah. because it's going to uh, over time it you know on the stress may end up finding its way into you know, your joints, your, your knees, like your lower back, like there's a better way to, to perform and do these exercises. So I find value in, uh, you know, like making sure the quality element is there, but in terms of like your original statement of the exercise itself, there is a biomechanical way to pull it off as long as it's done with good form and the prerequisites are applied. Well, listen, if there's ever going to be a time in your sport or your day where you're going to move in that range of motion, it makes sense to strengthen in in that range of motion, i.e. the gymnast or the wrestlers. Yes. They're contorting their body yeah. in these weird positions. And so that you want to be strong in, be this, familiar with it. in this rolled up extended position that you may not normally get in normal life. But if I'm wrestling on the ground with someone, if I'm folded over like a lawn chair, I want to be strong in, in that fact, position. Along right. those lines. Let's say you strengthen your body with what's considered traditional perfect form, and you never strengthen your body in those positions. That's how you get hurt. And then you get hurt, right? Because you generate all this force, and then as soon as you move outside that position, you lack the stability and control to manage the force that you might have generated going into it, and that's how you get injured. This is part of the reason why we see normal people get injured doing the most basic things like reaching back and feeding their kid in the back seat yep. or pulling a weed uh, from the from the ground or picking up a bottle of shampoo in the shower. These are the most some of the most basic movements, but because they're twisting and rotating, and they and, never do that, and they never do yep. that in their training, then it doesn't take much for them to tweak something or to yep. injure themselves. And so again, you might see someone doing this weird rotating type of movement or motion inside the gym and go, "Oh, that is stupid or yeah. dangerous," or you shouldn't. Do it. But the truth is, you may if you do that sometime in your in in, in your day day to day and you and you're not strong on that you you're at risk now a big part of that and this is uh, this is it needs to be made very clear you have to own the movement right so you can look i'll tell you what the most basic movement a barbell curl can be very dangerous for somebody who lacks the prerequisite skill mobility and connection right a simple exercise like a barbell curl could be dangerous for someone barbell squats all the way down can be dangerous for someone or they could be very safe for someone right it depends on do you control the weight? Do you have the stability, the mobility? Are your joints supporting the weight in the sense that you know your end of range of motion is your spine or are, is it the muscles that are supporting your spine? This is all very important. You use the example of a gymnast. You know, I had a gymnast that worked for me years ago. I learned so much just from watching this guy because he would do movements like he would do dips and he would go so low in the parallel dip bars. And I remember thinking, oh, his shoulders – have got to be wrecked. And yet he had some of the healthiest shoulders the of all opposite time. Ends up being true. And I remember talking to him about it and he goes, oh yeah, he goes, I couldn't do that when I first started training. Mm -hmm. He goes, I had to really build the strength and stability to be able to do that. But now I have so much control in that range of motion. Now, if I tried to do that without building up to it, for sure I would hurt myself. Now, it is true that exercises, that, that not, not all exercises are created equal, and that some exercises, if your form is off a little bit, the risk goes up quite a bit. Usually it's the compound, you know, the compound complex lifts. But nonetheless, movements, if you can do them right and you control them right and you have the stability, they're not dangerous. My favorite examples are the behind the neck exercises, yeah. behind the neck pull down, behind <clears throat> the neck press. Like Olympic lifters 
do behind the neck presses all the time. In fact, they they catch the weight on their traps yeah. all the time. Most bodybuilders would hurt their shoulders doing that because they don't have the the stability to do it. Yeah, I got to give a, a bit of a shout out. It's uh, I think his handle is Atlas Power Shrugged. Um, but I follow this guy, total unconventional lifter, and bringing back a lot of the really old school movements and barbell movements, you know, bent presses. Mm -hmm. uh, he does things where he's basically, he's doing like a, a clean behind his back and he'll do like hack squats and things, you know, mm -hmm. with his with a barbell behind him. Those are old school. Really yeah. old school techniques, but it just, it, for a common person walking by, they would probably be like, whoa, stop, you're going to hurt yourself. What are you doing? You know, and this guy is like, showed his whole process of getting strong in these old school movements uh, and, and built himself up to be resilient enough to, to pull these movements off. Yeah, it, you, really the injuries occur and they can occur with any exercise. And of course, like I said earlier, um, some exercises, if you go outside of perfect form and control, the risk goes up dramatically. Whereas with other exercises, the risk doesn't go up uh, so much. But if you hurt yourself doing an exercise, it's because you didn't own it. That's all it is. Like you either use too much weight for the type of strength that you have. You lacked the stability. You lacked the mobility. You just didn't own the exercise. And that's why you got hurt. That's the only reason you get hurt. An exercise won't hurt you if you own it, and I don't care what the exercise is. So you see videos of, of these trainers and coaches saying things like, you know, don't do side laterals with your pinkies higher than your thumb because it could pay, place your shoulder and shoulder impingement and whatever. Mm -hmm. Not if you own the exercise. Now, I will agree it it's more complex. It requires more stability. It requires different strength and stability that may, maybe some people own, but that doesn't mean the exercise is dangerous. And again, I like to point to those behind the neck exercises because like behind the neck pull downs, you know, in the sixties and seventies, that was a staple at pull-ups. They would do behind the neck pull-ups all day well, long. In, in yeah. defense of the trainers that used to, cause I was part of this group that used to um, talk shit about the behind the neck, everything and, and going deeper than 90 and the deep dips and all this stuff. Your national certifications said that. I mean, oh, yeah. I, I remember being at least two or three national certifications deep in a couple of years' experience. Yep. Uh, that, that's my point. They is said, that, don't go down below 90 yeah, degrees. They, I, I mean, I was literally that guy who was training behind a client uh, when they were doing like dumbbell bench press and, and letting the, their elbows would touch my yep. my hands. Okay, back up. You know, oh, Or their dips. I would have my hand where their, their chest would hit. Okay, back up. Yep. You know, I didn't want them going deeper than that because I thought it put them at risk because that's everything that was what we were taught we were taught to do that and it, you know it's so funny because I don't think I ever thought to challenge that it just made sense like oh yeah you know that's it's putting them at risk why would we do that and I I can stimulate the muscle just fine by going just down to 90 degrees but you know it never dawned on me like yeah you stop doing that and you lose the ability to do that so what happens in real life when you accidentally move in that that range of motion yeah, what, are you can move like a robot your whole life yeah like you just it just didn't dawn on I, me until way later in my career I same yeah. thing my first certification was <clears throat> was not even a national cert so when I started with 24 hour fitness they had their was own certification Apex. Yeah. no it was 24 hour well, fitness university yes and I remember when I did, this was 19 I want to say 97 and I remember the instructor explaining why we should not go all the way down on a bench press so he said stop at 90 degrees and then what he did is he had a towel this was his example and it like stuck with me i'm like oh my god that makes sense he twi he said this is what it's like when you go all the way down and he took the towel and he twisted it really tight and then he started bending it and he's like this is what happens to your shoulder and of course i don't question him as the instructor right so i taught everybody at 90 degrees yeah. later on i understood how the scapula moved and the <coughs> shoulders moved and i read books on evolution how we have these these this this incredible uh, mobility and control with our shoulders one thing we evolved with is is with is that these incredible shoulders allow us to throw with accuracy and all that stuff and i remember thinking what if i just strengthened that position and was able to move within that and then i started training that way and of course you get better results but you, it, it's you know what it reminds me of it reminds me of when people say um, oh, you got always lift with your legs because they're so afraid of their back. So everything looks like a like a front squat when they pick things yeah. up. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, okay, what you're basically doing is you're trying to remove all potential risk by limiting your range of motion so much. But the reality is if you do that all the time, you are actually setting yourself up for more potential injury in the future because then that's all you know how to that's do. That's exactly what happened to me. I mean, I, I had I had more shoulder issues, more hip and low back issues 
uh, in you know my early mid twenties than I do now forty Doing years everything old at ninety degrees because I was yeah. shortening everything up. And that's what you don't realize too is that you're not only are you shorting up, but then you're getting really strong and tight in that positions, which is even worse. Yeah. You'd be better off not doing anything. You know, and 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 like what, just see where where life takes me, <laughs> than to get really buff in this shortened range of motion because then you have all this power mm -hmm. and strength, but then you have no control in where the body technically could go. Well, my first introduction to isometrics, I was working at the gym when I had a lot of trainers that were super experienced, and one of the trainers was taking his athletes through just the pure isometric workout where they were in positions they'd be on the field where their legs super wide out they're rotated a bit and they're driving either a stick or just their body weight they're just squeezing and adding tension to these poses and i'm like what are you doing like it just looks so bizarre that he's taking these athletes through these very specific type of movement but he's familiarizing them uh, in these positions where you know they need to be able to drum up power they need to to summon force and, and control in those positions which then helps to, to apply towards the field. So not just strength training, but some days are devoted to, uh, you know, being familiar when an instance occurs where they're in that position on the field. Yeah, speaking of isometrics, uh, by far the most undervalued uh, piece of training technique that exists today. I mean, it's so, and it's so much more valuable than people give it credit for. When it comes to improving your mobility and your ranges of motion and connection to your ranges of motion, Nothing beats isometrics. Nothing. So let's say you squat to parallel and anything below parallel, you lose connection. Well, what you can do is you can, without weight, bring yourself down to just below parallel and then use isometrics to connect to that new range of motion. And you can continue to expand upon that. And it's the safest, most effective way to do it. In fact, this is the, and th this is a simplified version of what priming is. Priming really utilizes isometrics in this particular way. And then when it comes to building muscle and building strength, if you apply isometrics in this way, you will see tremendous gains through yeah. both the isometrics and also the new ability to, to, to connect. There's a 15 to 20 degree angle yes. uh, effect. So it actually like strengthens even further than just that yeah. position. Yeah. So if you do isometrics at 90, you're going to get strength all the way down to, you know, 70 and up to as high as maybe exactly. hundred. Not only that, but then now you can actually call upon specific muscles that you want to activate in exercises that traditionally aren't for that. Yeah. You guys, did you see the, uh, Brett Contreras posted a video of this girl, uh, you know, doing a butt wave. Yeah. Did I you see that. that? Yeah, I did. <laughs> I, and, and, and you laugh right. I know. I, content, I, I, yeah. I, but there's, you know, this car, it's, uh, you, you get why I'm bringing it up in this conversation. Yeah, she can connect to it. Because yeah. she can sit there without doing an exercise and she can activate all the muscles in her butt. Now, if you can do that, then you, whenever you squat, you deadlift, you lunge, you do anything. You know how to make it a butt exercise. You, that's right. You yeah. can now make that the dominant muscle being activated because you have the capability of mentally contracting that muscle without even moving. Mm -hmm. Add the movement in there where the hips are having to hinge, and you can really start to grab and pull Guarantee power from that's there. that's the new TikTok challenge. Yeah, the, butt, the butt wave. Watch it. The butt waves are coming. Justin but it's a good, does a butt it's a good, wave. It, I yeah. mean, it's a good first goal for anybody who is trying to develop a specific muscle totally. in their body, right? Oh, yeah. You, if you know, instead of you us, have access to it. Instead of us going and, and looking for somebody who's insta famous, who has this great butt, who probably did butt implants and all the exercises they do, and just trying to do those movements when you can't even isometrically contract the glutes, like that's where you start. Yep. You know, to your point, that's an easier thing that you can you can get to and safer. So get there to where you teach yourself to just be able to, to mm -hmm. actually squeeze it and contract it. Now you teach and, it to work more in the exercises. Right. So, all right, here's an advanced way of using isometrics for incredible power. So this is an at-home way of, of, it's an apparatus you could set up at home. So I'm going to give it to the, to the audience. And in fact, I'm going to try and find a way to set this up in my garage. So what you do is you put two bolts, really heavy duty bolts into oh. the concrete. Mm -hmm. Then you attach and a chain, chain, chain. to it mm -hmm. and then make it, make it a long chain so that you can adjust the length if you want. And then you can take a barbell or a, a metal bar and attach the bar to either side of the chain or, or chains on either side of the barbell at varying lengths. And you can get underneath it so you're like, let's say you're in a, in a full squat. So you get underneath the bar, chains attached to the bolts, and then with good posture, good technique, good control, you drive. Obviously, you're not going to do a squat, but you're driving against an immovable object. Mm -hmm. You could put a bench underneath that, do a press. You could do a row. You could do a curl with varying you know, lengths of the chain. 
this is how this is an advanced way to use isometrics and i'm gonna tell everybody right now if you try this you will not see faster strength gains than you will if you if you apply this now the strength gains come on very quick then they start to taper off after about six to eight weeks but they still keep coming but in that initial six to eight weeks you will see some ridiculous strength gains. And this is an old school technique that, mm -hmm. you know, uh, strength athletes used to do all the time. I wonder what would be better, that or like, you know, uh, Justin, I mean, I feel like you could do more power, what you're talking about, but- man, It's advanced. I, the dumpy squat was, uh, you know, mind blowing for me the first time that So that's better for connection and mm -hmm. priming, but what I'm talking about is advanced. So in other words, if you lack the connection, don't go and drive against some chains that are attached to the ground. Well, you're right. trying to ramp, you're trying to max. Yeah. No force. That's yes. what I mean. Like you could probably push more power out doing it, but that yeah. also increases the chances of you doing it poorly. Or also. injury. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So yeah. that's why I said it. You know, was advanced. All right. So speaking of cool advanced stuff, this, this might not be cool, but you know, for a while now we've been observing this drop in testosterone in men. There's been, it's, by the way, decades. Right. We've been observing this, uh, and this is well documented. I've been observing it in every coffee shop. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's very obvious. Yes, yeah, very obvious. It's it's really interesting. Could you describe what the it way looks they like? order? Could you describe what it looks like? <laughs> yeah, what does it look like? Justin? Yeah, come on, just, you like, guys know. Gauged earrings you know with uh, <laughs> long, long ponytail. Lots of uh, yeah decisions with their attire. Yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> Can I have the the, the frappuccino? The, the you know, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Uh, no, so this has been observed now for a while, and there's been a lot of theories as to why it's going on. Well, the 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 most, I guess, the theory that most scientists agree probably has an impact has to do with these estrogenic chemicals that we're just constantly exposed. Do to. they think that's one of the the main? Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, that would be the that's the prevailing theory. Now, there's no. Oh, smoking God, gun people, yet. People hate to hear that. They yeah. don't believe that shit. There's well, a, there's no smoke. Well, look, uh, BPAs, you know, phthalates, like like BPAs, for example, getting banned, mm -hmm. right? You can't have them in, in children's products anymore because we know that it it interacts with their their hormone system. So basically what they are is they're chemicals <clears throat> that have the potential to attach to estrogen receptors. So it's not estrogen, but because you're exposed to them, you're getting these estrogenic type effects and it can lower testosterone. It can cause you know, estrogenic type effects like, you know, fat gain or feminizing effects or, you know, stuff along those lines. And they, again, there's no smoking gun, but we're constantly being exposed to more and more of these. They're in plastics, they're in their chemicals. The, you know where the big one of the big ones is? You know, I th it drives me crazy to hear you say that because for the most part, like the the pans and like we've changed we've changed a lot of stuff. Mm. But the the two things that I haven't gotten rid of in my house that I know is probably one of these offenders is the the Glade plugins and can scented candles. Yes. Uh, I absolutely love those and I yeah. love the way it makes my house smell. And I haven't given that up. And this I was just gonna say that. Mm. So candles are a big one, right? Really? So they all yeah, because they they put all these chemicals in there. Well, you're it's burning off and you're breathing. You're it, literally which has got to be worse than like just it's all touching. the scented ones, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah which sorry, are the ones I like? Yeah, the one you like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that uh, I know receipts are a big one. You know the smooth waxy receipts. I remember when Max Lugavier said that. He's was like, don't it? even touch those basically what he said. It's just caked with it. Yeah. yeah. But but the candles is a big one, right? So we used to, Jessica's a huge candle. I don't think she likes candles as much as you, Adam. You know, it's funny. Adam literally can tell you this, like the cost of the average scented <laughs> big candle. I could. Yeah. Like, they run 18 to $20 so he, at, at Target for the, candles and for the three. Sorry, no, man. I really do. We have a- but I, Hold on. What are the, what are the scents? Are they like bubble gum and- No, I'm a, I have a, I have this <laughs> candy. vanilla addiction. So I like, I like vanilla smell uh, for yeah. some reason, but I'll do other, I do other stuff to try just to try it out. But I have so many that I have, uh, I have at least one to two candles out in every room. And then I actually have a storage place at my house that probably has 15 to 20. So I probably have 500 bucks worth of candles oh my at, at my, at my house wow. at all times. <laughs> That's ridiculous. That's how much I like them. I just like, yeah. I just like the, 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 the light smell that it puts so off. So did you switch? So I know you're, you're, you. I haven't. Much. That's what I was saying. You're bringing this conversation up and you're making me feel guilty that I haven't. I so haven't. public goods, uh, you, which I know you get a lot of your products. I have from, most of my stuff through public they goods. They have candles too. They have candles? And they're BPA free, phthalate free. They're essential oils essentially. And they're not expensive. Pull them up, Doug. Were they, were they, how much? Okay. So and they're still scented or are they just yeah. plain? Yeah. No, no. Oh. You can get scented candles they, they that are just scent? don't have all these candle, okay. the, the chemicals. So that's it's not good. the smell that's putting it off. It's something else that 
that's in it? No, no, no. It's the smell, but but the public goods candle uses essential oh, oils. Oh, look at that. And, and not, not these chemicals, in other words. You're not going to be bringing in, breathing in estrogen. I, I tell you what. <laughs> Maybe this that's why you're getting more candles this is, the more no, you breathe this is, in. You know, I tell you what about this company. This is, uh, I, I, I keep continue to fall in love more and more with them because I didn't even know they had this in there. That I, I've told you guys the last time we had a commercial for them that my house is like slowly getting converted over into yeah. all public goods. And here's the thing, check this out. 15 bucks for that thing. That's yeah. at least eight, I know it's at least 18 to $20 minimum at Target for that size of a candle right there. Yeah, so it's, so it's natural. There's no BPA, lead, dye. So what do they use, like phthalates. an essential oil? What do they use? Essential oils, okay. natural waxes. The wick is cotton, so you're not going to be breathing Damn. in. A bunch of and I, I like the way it looks too because I like the whole black and white thing yeah. going on. That's yeah. cool. So, I started to get paranoid. Like that's why I changed out all the shampoos, all the soaps, yep. all the stuff, and like that I was in close contact with all the time, drinking out of like you, you know aluminum instead of out of plastic, and mm -hmm. you know I just started doing. I don't know how much of an effect it's made, you know, because it's like it's just a volume thing. Well, right, I, over time, I still stand by what I originally said with this stuff. I think it's. I think you're funny and silly if you're the the, the hippie crunchy person that freaks out about all this stuff but all the time. You eat garbage every day, <laughs> but yeah, but yeah, you're exactly, about 5G. you know, or you have other areas that are much bigger rocks in your life, right? Yeah, you got like, a fucking ton of stress, and you do other bull, you do drugs or other bullshit, but then you won't have a fucking scented candle. It's like you know my buddy. Saying? I used to. Have, I had this yeah. buddy once that uh, every once in a while I train him, and he's like, and I, he'd be like, hey, I tell him, hey, try this supplement or whatever. Man, I don't know what's in that stuff. I don't want to take that. I'm like, bro. Last weekend, you took Molly off some dude you bought in a nightclub, <laughs> right? And you're afraid to take, you know, you know, citrulline before your workout. Yeah. But get your stand, get everything straight, man. But back to what I'm saying, like, so, but I, there's been, and I've Priorities. noticed that there's been a lot of like very subtle changes that I can change. Like, it's not that big of a deal for me to change my. If they both put off vanilla smell candles, it ain't that big of a jump for me. I didn't know they existed. I didn't know that public goods yeah, had switch this. Switch them out. Yeah, and so so the cool thing is with public goods, all their products are like that. All of them are you know earth friendly. All of the prices are great, and oh, you can get my smell vanilla, lavender. and you can get everything. So you can get everything, and then you save money on top of it because yeah. you're you track yeah no your, they're, they're yeah they're you know I've saved the toothpaste and the the soap, the laundry detergent. That mm -hmm. stuff yeah. gets up there in price. So it's kind of cool to be able to go to a product like this that I feel like not only is it superior, but then it's also cheaper. Yeah. Which Are you more aware of this stuff because you're a dad now? Is that what kind of triggered it? No, I think it's our conversations that have triggered that, to uh, be honest okay. with you. Yeah, because you got, you're probably the most hippie crunchy out of all of us. And you talk about this stuff, mm -hmm. and so, and at first, like I think I was a little resistant to a lot of it, where I was like, "That's stupid." I'm, I don't. It's there's much bigger rocks in yeah. life. Like before I go change my fucking candle out, I should probably do X, Y, and Z. Yeah. My thought process has changed a little bit on it because it's like, if it's if it's a product that like I am not adamant about exactly what hand soap brand I need to use. Yeah. I mean, it's not like I'm I'm in love with Dial or some brand that it's like, oh, it's so magical. I so, can't give up my... Yeah, <laughs> right. So, or, or my laundry detergent or things like that. Like, yeah. I, it's not like something that's hard for me to give up. So I don't mind doing that. Like it's not that. It's yeah, not switch that it out. Save money anyway. Well, I remember even before we had, I forget her name that was talking about testosterone and like all the, um, you know, the decline of everything yeah. in the phthalates. Oh, so, Carol. Yeah, Carol. Um, I was talking to a doctor before my son was born, and he was talking about like a lot of cases of of this kind of you know, being transmitted from, from the parents and the mother to where it's affecting the genitalia of young boys, especially. Yes. Uh, and, and to where like, and they measure, and this is what she kind of talked about with us uh, on our podcast was about like the taint, you know, <laughs> length and, yep. and how they measure that in terms of like, it's, it's, it's really bizarre, but like, they it, can this affect, is all they can affect it in mammals through testing. And because remember the, the, the genitalia is the is, length of the taint or how close you're yeah, yeah so you get closer to your butthole in a sense i'm going to be very you know vulgar about yes. this because remember the, the, the genitalia very medical remember in a yeah. fetus it's essentially the same until the the chromosomes tell the hormones to come in and testosterone comes in and it either can turn into a penis or become a clitoris but otherwise it's all it starts from the same point so let's say it's telling it's getting the signal to turn into a boy you know or or male genitalia but it's also getting these xenoestrogens, so it gets kind of a confused signal, and so the genitalia develops a little bit differently. So, so does smaller that penis, shorter uh, taint, and you know, shorter taint, smaller penises, and it's happening, I guess, like in numbers so that, that that's alarming. The 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 longer my taint, the more masculine I am. 
Uh, I think that's what it was. Yeah, yeah. I don't Big, know about masculine. Balls, yeah, longer that's more, distance. Masculinity is you know, more much male, more, than more just, alpha, or whatever. How no, we, I think it just means the genitalia is more the way it's supposed to be. Yeah, I don't know if it makes you more or less Interesting. masculine. Yeah, so interesting, right? Maybe yeah. more virile. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> hey, speaking of uh, <laughs> speaking of children, can I just tell you guys right now? This, this is early, so I don't want to be one of those dads where oh, guys. you watch I have a kid, kid your son. Yeah. He hasn't spoken a word yet. Yeah, you watch <laughs> your kid. He's a one, genius. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I can, you know, you have that conversation with your wife, honey. I know, bro. I'm guilty now, dude. I'm See, so, I told I, you. I'm, I'm oh, guilty of this. So kid. Max, is, not to cut your story off, no, no, you, but this. you know, uh, Max is into um, like one of his favorite shows to watch or cartoons is uh, Baby Einstein's. Have you guys seen this? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's not. It's it is very. It seems like it was made in like the '90s or earlier. It's early, and but it, it and it starts off with like a a Mozart song, and then all my, my son used to watch. My older son. Oh my God, he's so infatuated Baby with Einstein. it. Baby Einstein, what a great cartoon. Oh, and it's just it, well, it's teaching them all these different sounds too. So they 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 play like. And it's all uh, old school classical music, uh -huh. and so it's really interesting. There's, it's not super action, and the graphics aren't great in it. But he's so drunk. So you're like, and I tell Katrina, I think time, he's a genius. That's why I said, <laughs> I, said I said, tell me he's not. They like this kid is that, not dude. watching bullshit cartoons. Look what he wants to watch. Like, <laughs> he wants to learn. He wants to learn about Beethoven and Mozart right now at this age. <laughs> yeah. He's going to be a genius. I love it. Well, so <laughs> <I'm> distinguished. <laughs> so so okay, you guys know what? My son started pushing that little sled around, yeah, yeah, and just video, loves it. And now he so runs great. with it. And yeah. he whips that thing around, and I'm like, honey, I'm like, he's like, he's kind of strong for a little baby. I don't know. <laughs> so anyway, he's gonna be a monster. She sent me a video. So we have these. I these, saw the loaded box. So we dude. have these boxes that we put like Christmas decorations and stuff away, and you know, wrapping stuff, and we store. Well, anyway, she sends me this video of him driving this box around the house on the floor, and he's having a great time. And I'm like, man, that box, it's a big plastic box. It's, you know, relatively heavy. And I see him like, it gets stuck and he'll like, pull it back and like drive it. Anyway, I go home and I find the box and I pick it up and I'm like, this box weighs probably more than he does. So I'm like, let me see. So I get him in front of it and he gets so excited and he starts driving that thing around the house, pushing it into chairs, pushing the chairs with it. And I'm like, I sat down with Jessica. I'm like, honey. <laughs> Just I, grunting. I think I, find, I think I got. I think the right genetic mix hit yeah. this kid. I think oh, this yeah. is going to be. A you're moment. at the. You are at. At least for me, uh, you're at the, the. My favorite. Like one of my favorite times. Like when you hit that like one year mark, it felt like it felt like I've just said this before. It felt like Twilight Zone for the first six yeah. six months. Then you fart. Fart. Then you start thinking. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. You do sometimes. Then, wow. yeah, then you start thinking like from six months to a year. It's like okay, this is getting better. We yeah. have a routine down now. You're, you got stuff like you're in the swing of things. And then year one hits, and here come all the milestones. Like so used to like oh he's saying a word. Oh he's putting two words together. Oh he's walking now. Oh he's running. Oh he can jump. But like yeah. this is where it all starts from here on out. Like it was. I remember like every day would be fun well, coming it's, home. It's, from so work. we taught him si certain signs for sign language. Yeah. So we could communicate with us and he's starting to try to say words like he says bye bye and mama but uh, he doesn't say much right he's only a year old but he does the signs and so one of the signs is for food and so what he does is he, he'll put his hand to his mouth like this that means food right mm -hmm. and this kid can eat like he can eat now he's not he's obviously burning it off i don't know where he puts it but he eats like a like a little machine and if we're kind of like putting it off or like we're busy he'll walk up to us with this stern look <laughs> He'll grab, he'll grab my face and he'll make eye contact with me and then he'll take his hand and then he'll do it to me. <laughs> like, food, motherfucker, feed me yeah, some yeah. food. Feed me, man. Yeah, dude, I'll start laughing. Yeah, <laughs> and I'll be like, hilarious. all right, uh, calm down. Dude. I'm, sure, I'm sure part of it has to do with the food that Jessica prepares. She literally makes tri-tips. So she'll mm. get the grass-fed tri-tips. He's like a little caveman. She'll make them, then she'll blend them. Then she'll blend them with vegetables like zucchini and broccoli and asparagus and then sweet potato. And this kid just throws it down. So, I'm glad you brought nice. that up because one of the number one things I get, and we can address this right now so I don't have to keep responding to so many DMs around it, is people always want to know what I'm feeding Max in, like on a regular basis. Yeah. He eats exactly what Katrina and I eat. 
It just uh, unless Katrina and I are eating something bad, then we don't feed him that. He gets it, he gets it. But we literally make our food like, and we and she normally makes Irish her, whiskey. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she normally gives gives uh, or makes a, a pretty good size to where we'll have leftovers, and then she just portions off his stuff yeah. in a, these little containers, and it's sweet potato, rice, yams, uh, you know, bi uh, bison, ground beef, turkey. I mean, chicken. He eats all of it, man. Yeah, Veal. He eats it. everything that we whatever we have for dinner. We just portion off whatever uh, whatever we're having over to him, and he eats yeah. he eats it all. We introduced him to fish and sushi really early. Does he like that? Yeah, he'll yeah. eat he eats everything, and so it's I, it's not special. I'm not doing anything. I use I do use the Serenity Kids stuff every now and then. So like if we're on the go and we're not and we're trying to feed him, like have you ever looked at other? Ba well, I'm sure I know you did. You look at other baby foods. Oh, yeah, it's all sugar. Yeah, like, no wonder yeah. you switch your kid from like you know this baby food to real food, and they don't like anything. No, yeah. my kids don't like anything. Well, I wonder why it's you were giving super him sweet. candy for you know his first year, and now he's not going to want to eat regular. Yeah, you know. I I see where parents get caught in doing that because they, they you well, one, it's always start, or at least what I've seen, it starts with everybody wants to see the reaction, right? All the family wants to, oh, give them a candy, give them a cookie. Oh, like legit candy? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So they could see the crazy reaction that, that they do. And then they realize, they oh my God, dealer. how much he or she loves it. And then mm -hmm. they use it as a bribe tool, oh, like yeah. as, as a way to, to get them to do things. Oh, sit down you do this. I'll give you this. I'll give you that. Yep. And then it's like, once you open Pandora's box, dude, it's, it's a, it's yeah. a wrap. That kid's going to want of candy. I'm so yeah. mad at you for bringing in a box of, uh, blow pops. <laughs> <laughs> a box of listen. Katrina where's got the box. A, Katrina, we, we it's over. Show it's, everybody. It's over there. It's yeah, we got. That's not even ha you know. That's not even half of them. I have. Bro, it's a big ass box of blow pops, and I've eaten four this morning. You know, I, I never even what? asked her what what the the logic behind why she did. So for my party for my fortieth, she did like a like a sweet table. And it was just like, you know, all the treats and everything like that. And she had all those blow pops and they just, they've lasted. Nobody's eaten them all. What did you been, say? You're trying to make it popular again? Yeah, yeah. Is I'm trying to bring it, it yeah. back. I told her I've been, I've been, I, I've been having one at least a day right yeah, now. Yeah, but you, <laughs> but you suck on them, which I is I do. Weird. I think it's, <laughs> that's weird. I think it's weird that you think a, who takes a blow pop and crunches it on the first bite fucking man uh, uh, <laughs> you brought what ll cool j dude you remember like the thing it always used to creep me out because he'd be like on a music video and he'd be like yeah licking his lips a million yeah. times I'm like mm -hmm. yeah, dude, yeah stop that's yeah. gross dude. you know that work you know that, that some shit that? no you know for sure at one point in his life that some girl said Oh my God! When you lick your lips, it's a, <laughs> and that it was it. That's it. No, yeah. what it is? It's like every guy, every guy that does something quirky and yeah, weird. One girl told I, me that. I believe so one like hot video. chick yeah. said something to that guy. and said, "Man, when you like, do you that, me out, that LL. that's true for most guys." But LL Cool J is a famous, you know, good-looking, fit, wealthy. Dude. Yeah, but it probably he could do anything. It yeah. started before. Don't you believe that? Maybe. Oh, I'm sure. I I'm believe sure that. That way, yeah. dude. Uh, speaking of the kids too, like I don't know if I told you guys, but like my youngest is like a total trendsetter. Is he really? School. Yeah, like I, I picked him that. up a few times and it's funny because I do remember that was a bit of like what my personality, I would try to like get whatever the other kids didn't have, you know, every like whatever was cool at the time, I would try to like find something totally different and try to like create my own thing. And so it's just, I've noticed that like sometimes like he went to class one time with a, a total mohawk and I'm like, dude, that is a bold move. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's a serious move. The other day he wore like a, uh, like a sport coat and like a sport coat, yeah, and then he put on That's some awesome. uh Felix Gray glasses and he just went in with Wait, his hair all slicked. Uh, so what grade is he in now? He's uh in <laughs> third grade, third, third grade, grade. Yeah. yeah, wow, yeah. third grade, he's doing that, yeah. That's a big deal in third grade. Oh, yeah. Yeah, especially like third, fourth, fifth, sixth. I was like this. I was totally like that. I remember you and I talked about this. this when we first met, I remember that was one of the things that I liked about you because I was like, ah, oh, that's how I was. I was always about I know. I connected with you like that because it's, I mean, I'm not like a huge fashion guy, but I definitely like to find things that like nobody else has or like yeah. I could be unique somehow with so it. So what did you get feedback on the glasses and the sport club? I Dude, like the kids were all asking him about it. Like, you know, why are you wearing those? And like he, he kind of like... You know, and he, he says that it's good for him when he's on the screen, you know, right. and so I've, I've at least like good sort of job, indoctrinated dude. him with that. 
And so it's I'm going to be interested to see if this becomes a thing like within this class if like the other kids are going to be like all of a sudden wearing them and then he'll like not wear them yeah. once they all Your wear son's them. got an affiliate code? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll throw it to him. Yeah. Bro, hey, now that we're invested in him, I'm all for that, dude. That's yeah. that's where it's at. That's all it takes is one pop, popular kid yeah. to make it cool. Make it a trend it. in the schools. Yeah, so yeah like, forward slash for Everett. You know, use code <laughs> Everett 50 for... That's hilarious. You're hustling, dude. Yeah. Hey, speaking of discounts and this kind of stuff, I found an old Milton Friedman clip. So Milton Friedman is that you hadn't watched. I so there's so many clip. There's so many videos of him talking yeah, how did to, that at, at universities. Like yeah. they're long and sometimes they drab on. And so I have. I don't. I guess I haven't seen every single one. Right? I thought I'd seen every one. I thought for sure you have. No, and maybe I did see this one. I just forgot this particular point. But he was speaking at it. It looked like he was speaking at a college and he was talking about inflation. So here's the interesting. So Milton Friedman, my my favorite economist of all time. And he was really popular during the 70s and 80s. So during the inflation, during the inflation of the 70s, and then after when we tried to correct it, and we did correct it with rising interest rates. And so some of his talks were around inflation. And what's cool about a lot of stuff that, well, all the stuff that Milton Friedman says is he, it's, it's still applicable today because economics, the laws of economics don't change. So it's really cool because you'll see what he says. And he says, he'll warn people, if you do this, it's going to happen. And this is what's going to happen. And sure enough, all that stuff happens. Really cool. But anyway, he talks about inflation. And I didn't even think about this. So inflation was blowing up in the 70s. And he says, you may think that if prices go up by 10% and you increase your wages by 10%, that you're in the same place you were before. He goes, you're not. Oftentimes, making 10% more puts you in a brand new tax bracket. So now you're actually paying an additional 5% in taxes. Oh, so you're actually making less money. I didn't even think about that. Yeah. You might think that if prices go up by 10% and your income goes up by 10%, you're in the same position as you were before. But you're not. You're pushed up into higher brackets of the income tax. And on the average, if, your income, if prices go up 10% and your income goes up 10%, your taxes will go up 15%. Think about that right now. If well, you that's, how that, that's how they're trying to justify it for a lot of people because wages are going up right now like crazy everywhere. Everywhere is having – because there's jobs that are needed, but people aren't wanting to go back to work because they're making money staying at home. So yeah. the only way that they can entice people to come to work is by raising the wages. So then you got everybody who's like, oh, okay, inflation's going up, but who cares because now I'm making five more dollars an hour than what I was before. Well, oftentimes, actually, if you look at the numbers, the new wages don't match the <laughs> the, co the real cost oh, yeah, of new do. products, especially like things like gas and food, which often aren't included in the you know, in their, in their numbers. Mm -hmm. I mean, gas alone, like, uh, so where do you stand public. all this stuff like that? I mean, at what point do I get to say that I was right on this one and you were wrong because about it was a, about it being a bubble that's been going for now, or do you get to just keep saying it's a, an inflated, 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 inflated bubble. And then oh, no, eventually I, okay. here's the deal. Like I, the Peter Schiff move. You're just going to keep calling. Well, crash. here's the deal. Nobody can, <laughs> nobody can predict uh, the infinite bubble. Yeah. Nobody's going to predict the, the, when the market's going to correct. But I think if you look at it, first off, you to look at the smartest people. Some of the smartest people in investments right now are pulling out. They're mm. they're they're selling. I mean, Elon Musk sold the a ton. Pull out method. Right, Bezos sold a ton. Like these guys who are usually make pretty good calls. Well, Buffett Buffett is now pulled out quite a bit of money. Right now, they still have lots of holdings in the market. Yeah, but you can tell that they they're looking at things and saying. This isn't looking uh, well. Too good. I well, yeah. A lot of those guys, especially like Elon, I don't know about Buffett, but a lot of those guys are in tech stock, and tech stock hasn't made sense for like the last decade. Like it's it, it, what drives the market. It's well, so yeah, and it's there, but they're getting like 15, 20 times valuation. It's like crazy yeah. inflated numbers. It's all speculative, and it's not like real hard data that's like supporting. Okay, this company's doing X. It's grown this much. It should do that this much. So people are just speculating on the future of what these things are and how much they're dominating and how fast they're growing. And so they're 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 basically buying stock on where it should be in ten years from now versus like looking at it year to year. So yeah. I think that they're probably pulling out of a lot of those stocks because look at how fast those ones can go the opposite direction. Look what happened with Zoom. Look what happened with all the i uh, yeah. the i buying stock. Like anything that's like tech related right now, I is on a crash. Big yeah. Time. Well, a lot of a lot of things are, but you know, with inflation, what you have is let's say the government needs to raise you know a trillion more dollars in taxes. Well, they can either raise everybody's taxes, which is very unpopular, probably not going to get reelected, or they can print a bunch of money. They're the ones using the, 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 the new money first. So now they can pay for all their 
projects and pay all their special interests. Like if you look at these spending bills, by the way, look at the percentage of them that actually went to people with like, we need relief. And then look at the percentage that went to <coughs> special interests. It's ridiculous, right? It's a, yeah. it's a massive discrepancy. But it's an easy way for them to tax people without people realizing it. And then on the other side, what I just talked about with Milton Friedman, I didn't even think about that. If you raised everybody's pay by 10%, you would you would put because we have a progressive tax code, right? Our tax code works. It's not flat. It's not like everybody pays the same percentage. It's if you make this much, you pay a low percentage, and the more you make, the greater the percentage of the amount that you make, you end up paying. The house so, always wins. So exactly. So you make ten percent more, and everything's ten percent more expensive. You're like, oh, I'm in the same place, except you're spending now five percent more or ten percent more in taxes. In reality, you're worse off than you were before because of the tax. Liability. Well, especially if you're a W-2 employee, right? I mean, if you're working a nine to five type of job where you have like a standard salary and you go up 10%, you're really affected by that. Yeah, but I yeah. thought that was really interesting. I had never thought of that. I, th I didn't even think about what, and I don't know what those numbers look like, but I- I'm, It's just crazy. I mean, people think that like inflation is like innocuous. Like it's not going to affect, you know, them like substantially. Well, what's crazy is in the 70s- Well, the we rich people it, that are pushing for it doesn't affect them that much. Well, that's why they want, they want <laughs> you to think that. Well, that's why they don't get, they exactly. don't give a shit if milk goes up 3X, gas prices go up yeah, 2 or 3X. Yeah, rich people don't care if their food costs go up, you know, 30%. Yeah, as long as their assets so, go up 150%, yeah, especially. Yeah, yeah if, you're, if, you're, if you're wealthy enough to where you're investing ten to $20,000 per month in, in stocks and bonds, and assets like what do you care if if your your grocery budget just went up a couple hundred dollars it's you know it does especially when all those asset prices are yeah. going through the roof with inflation yeah. and what they did in the in the 80s to stop the inflation is they jacked up interest rates and there was like a two-year recession but then everything corrected and then we had the boom <laughs> of the 80s you know with the deregulation of the reagan era and all that stuff today we have such massive debt that if they raise interest, we won't be able to pay off the service fees on the new on the debt. So they ran, they basically essentially we don't have any tools to handle massive inflation. So it's like, wh what do we do? Right. We raise interest rates, so we now default. What does that look like? What is that going to end up looking like? Mm. Which is kind of, speaking along those lines. I don't know if you guys are noticing that. Oh, first off, did you guys see that we? What did we do with the Beijing Olympics? We essentially said we're going to boycott <laughs> sending over uh, representatives over there. Did you guys see I, this? No, I didn't know that. Just, yeah, I just saw some. Yeah, maybe Doug can find this. That. Uh, and um, the basically, the leader of China is like, we don't care or whatever. And then I'm seeing in the news the anti-China propaganda now is starting to. You know, people are beating the drums. Even the even the left, which typically was kind really? of silent on it. Yeah. So I don't know what they're planning that on on so doing. Oh, great. Yeah. So Here the White go. House announces U.S. diplomatic boycott of the 2022 Winter Olympics in Beijing. So there's, st and, and now I'm seeing the news on all sides start to say things about China. Whereas before you, you had kind of maybe the right saying stuff about China, the left was kind of silent. Now the left is starting to kind so, of come out. So it, it sounds to me like the propaganda is, is starting still for something. avoiding, you know, calling the new variant what, you know, the following <laughs> yeah. letter should have what been. What exactly is a diplomatic boycott? What does that, what does that mean? What is that, we're not sending athletes there either? Nobody? I, like what's... Uh, we're not contributing to the fanfare of the games is what it says there. So I'm not quite sure. Does I don't that know mean if, like we're not going to promote it? Like, I don't understand. Are there, are you, are maybe athletes still going to be able to, are athletes still going to go there? Maybe Doug can, can find exactly what it says. I believe athletes are still going. They're just it's not we're not sending any representatives for the con country as far as you know the, like the political type of uh, uh, so it's like yeah, that's, big, why, that's why I'm asking like what does public, that mean what does that what, like, that just means we're not doing it and so well, we're we are doing our no it. athletes are going over yeah there. so I'm, that's where I'm, <laughs> I'm confused here like what what does it, it sounds like it just means that we're not going to promote it over here I think this is like a uh, it's like a symbolic I think know, it's symbolic public gesture. Yeah, which, I, which, by the way, don't it's, isn't nothing. Like if you on a public stage announce you're doing, even if it doesn't mean much, what you're saying to the world is we don't agree. Because what they're saying is the reason why they're doing it is because of the human rights issues in Hong Kong and with what's that group of people in China that are that they're the Uyghurs. Thank you. They're taking them and they're putting them in concentration, you know, kind yeah. of re-education camps and so, stuff like that. Yeah, I, was, I heard about that with Muslim um, concentration camps that they've you know the the world's been criticizing them about that yeah. what's happened as a result of that like i know that there's been, it's been brought up a few times well now we're now it looks like we're all officially saying hey this is a big issue whereas before it was kind of silent yeah so it sounds to me like they're bringing up the 
either they're they're doing the propaganda thing to prepare for the midterms so that they can get people to you know pick a side or whatever, mm. or they're preparing for something else. And oftentimes, what you'll see, and you'll see this in the media, is when the government is about to take a step, they prepare by getting public support with mm -hmm. new <clears throat> articles and and shit like that. So. This will be interesting. Uh, we'll, well, well, let's pay attention, I guess. Yeah, let's let's uh, let's end up seeing. Soon they're going to be in the metaverse. That's where all the Olympics will be, like everything else. We won't even go anywhere or fly anywhere. We'll just get on our That's VR so goggles. <laughs> uh, how are we it's coming. You know what? I saw actually every almost every day now. I don't know. I I I'm, keep watching all this stuff. I'm so interested in where it's going. Yeah. Um, Tender is now moving into the metaverse. How's that mm. work? I have fucking no idea. <laughs> I, I have no idea how any of this stuff works. You date it's, in you the can, metaverse? You can bang your, your alien dragon fantasy. I, yeah, there. but there, I mean, it, it seems like every day I see a new big company that is like VR vagina moving in that I mean, direction. How do you even do anything? I, Sure, it just dude. it just seems so Party. weird. I mean, I feel like there's so much money and hype around a lot of stuff right now. Just I, this is where I do feel like a bubble burst is coming or a, well, a correction a is totally. going to happen. Do me a favor. In the last ten years, name one market that would have lost you money. Yeah, you could have invested in stamps, in ten years, yeah. baseball cards, the <laughs> stock market, real estate. You could have invested in used cars or cars even now. You know, <laughs> that's what's Lumber. annoying to listen to your friends. Like, yeah. oh, I just I, I invested in crypto this, yesterday. This is why you see all these people on social media who are now these investment experts. Oh, yeah, this is what I. Well, yeah, because right now you could swing a bat in the dark and you're gonna hit something. Something's gonna work. Yeah, so that's why I'm a little bit like, hey, this kind of seems. Uh, Seems like a bubble. No, especially with the the NFT stuff. I mean, I feel like everybody is is jumping on this and buying random NFTs for random companies and stuff. But who who was I listening to? I think it was. I mean, Gary V pushes it pretty hard. I mean, and he makes a pretty good case for like people that have like a network. Like for example, we have a network of people yeah. that are pay attention to us. It's like you're you're giving them a a. A portion of the company, right? So if you if you give them these NFTs, you know they they invest in it. They're investing in you because as long as you continue to grow, mm -hmm. those things drive up. So you know it gives the ability for your early adopters and supporters in whatever movement or it is that you're doing their ability basically to invest in you in the, in in your own digital. I think way. we still have no idea what that's going to look like, right? Yeah, and we yeah. have no idea. I think I like your your what you said before. I think a lot of these big sales are are people laundering. That's what yeah. I think. Yeah, I thought did, that was the did best. You see, did you see? I did that yesterday. Did you see my story? Where no. I, yeah, I said that NF, NFTs are the new drug dealer flex. Yeah. <laughs> so I just said, like, oh, you got the fucking great babe. Oh, he must have fucked. You know, that's a, that's a $10 million deal he just did right there. <laughs> yeah. But he's moving big weight. You when know do you put that on your phone? Yeah. yeah. You show girls. I, I, you show know, I saw stuff. they, uh, I follow some of these NFT pages, right? And this uh, kid was like at like a concert and his backpack was, you know, a, one of those digital apes. So he's walking around and it's again, it's like a flex. Like if you are you if you're in in that world at all and you're paying attention to it, you're you so kind of know weird. what the real expensive ones are. And so if you see somebody with it on their backpack, you're like, oh shit, that's that, so weird. That's like ten grand right that's there. Like, hey, speaking of tech, Justin, did you see that NASA? Did you see the NASA Dart? Did you see this? Dart? Dart. It's no. called I think. Doug, maybe look this up. This isn't the one you brought up the other day where no, it's got kinetic no, energy. No, that was really cool. That was the, cool. NASA Dart, they're they're starting to work on a concept where if a meteor is coming close to the Earth, they could fire off a rocket and hit the meteor and put it off course so that it won't hit the Earth. And they're calling Okay, it now the is this a like a, a dummy? Missile in terms of yes. it not exploding, right? Because you don't yeah. want to explode a meteor; it would shower us with. No. Why, why can't we ones? shoot like four satellites up and make a giant like web trampoline? Yeah, Whoa. that's totally that's, that's so sciencey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no. I mean, why we can't just, we just put rockets I mean, on the Earth and move the point, Earth out of the way? Sense. Well, that's right? a good point. That's you know actually what I'm haven't yeah. thought of that. No, it's <laughs> a, so yeah. You don't want to nuke um, a meteor because now yeah. you have four meteors. Well, we don't want to go. That's why I say use a, we use a big trampoline so it hits the trampoline. And no, there it is, right there. So I guess it's launched off of a satellite, and the goal is to hit. So you want to hear my theory around this? Hmm. Okay, so it sounds great, right? Oh, we're gonna spend a bazillion dollars to to potentially, you know, save us from a meteor. I think we want a diplomatic reason to put a freaking super accurate missile on a satellite, and sure. other countries are gonna be like, "We, you can't do that." Well, no, no, it's to save us from a meteor. We have missiles in space. Yeah, yeah, and we can yeah. shoot moving. Bow down. We can shoot moving rockets. Oh, or, excuse dude. me, moving targets. So. 
hitting China is going to be super easy. Just that fly. You know, of that's, course. That's, dude, what that's what it always amounts to. Any kind of new toy is just about like who's got the biggest, coolest toy and who can you know do the most damage. Mm-hmm. Hey, real quick, you got to check out one of our partners, Olipop. Now, they make sodas that taste like the great sodas you had growing up as a kid, except very, very low in calories, uh, very low sugar or no sugar. They have compounds in them to help with gut health. In fact, you can consider these sodas gut health supplements. They're phenomenal, and they taste good. I love them, and of course, because you listen to Mind Pump, there's a discount. So if you're interested, head over to Drink olipop.com so drink o-l-i-p-o-p.com forward slash mind pump and use the code mind pump for 20 percent off all right here comes the rest of the show first question is from anthony otto what are some tips for improving your bench press or other lifts without a spotter oh good old ben and i used to i used to think i needed a spotter yeah. with bench press all the time that's because i would train to failure so often that you know, you, you miss which rep is failure, and then that's it. You're stuck. Right. You just didn't want to be left in the situation where you got to roll the bar down your stomach down and then just totally smash your I just kids. wanted to put some 45s on there, and I couldn't do it without help. You know? <laughs> 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 that's 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 trippy you want to know what's funny? I know we're going to answer this question, by the way, but this is, this is something interesting. The, the early days of bench press, in fact, you can see this in pumping iron. The bars on the bench press that held the barbell were close together. So you would grab the barbell on the outside of the bars, right. which meant you couldn't load one side at a time. So it literally was designed for people to load both ends at the same time. So it's like they literally designed it originally for- So you needed two people. Yeah, Doug remembers, right, Doug? I do. Yeah. You know, we I got we those uh, got. weights at Sears, I think it was back in the day. They were like concrete and plastic. Yeah, plastic. yeah, yeah. And I bought a bench with Sand these two ones. very narrow uh, yeah. bars, and I put that thing on there, and the thing was so unstable. It was a disaster waiting to happen. Now, were the were the commercial gyms like that, too? Because yeah. I know that's like if you were to, if you just bought a at home bench mm. set up just a couple, two decades ago, it was like that. Yeah, no, the original that, was, ones were. Eventually, I mean, very quickly though, they figured out, oh, if you put them on the outside, it's it's much more stable. You know what I used to do with those, Doug, is because I had the same problem, is I would move the barbell way over to one side so I could load mm -hmm. one side, then load the other side and then slide it over. It was like this whole pain in the ass. <laughs> All right, so let's, let's answer this question, right? So bench press. Here's a general piece of advice and then I'll give you something a little bit more advanced and specific. First off, one of the best ways to increase your lifts is to do them very frequently. But there's a caveat with this, which is you can't do them super hard very frequently. So in other words, let's say you want to improve your bench press. Maybe once a week you have your traditional hard bench press workout. And then you can bench press another three days a week, but you're not going as intense. You're either focusing on speed, so you're going explosive with the push, mm -hmm. or you're focusing on form and technique, or you're doing tension to where you're yeah. holding it at the bottom right above your chest. Maybe that's a, a sticking point. So basically frequency, lots of practice, uh, but again, modify the intensity. And then the second piece would be, this is something I discovered much later on. It's a great, great tool is variable resistance. So like adding resistance bands to the bar so that the bar gets harder, the further away you push it uh, from your body, which makes it harder where you're stronger that's an advanced technique, but it's one of yeah. the best ones I've well, used. We kind of covered all the bases, but um, in, in terms of uh, your sticking point and, and kind of focusing on the weakest part of the lift and generating more force within that, uh, and this is this is something that a lot of power lifters uh, are known to, you know, focus on to really get them through and, and progress, uh, you know, past some of their limitations. But you know, staying there and like doing pause reps where we're squeezing down, we're we're generating more force in that low position of the yeah. bench, uh, really makes a massive difference. And just like increasing the grip strength and 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 control uh, will add more security and stability uh, within that that exercise itself too, which will then allow you to, you know, uh, shuttle more force and, and increase your strength. So I feel like these are all kind of generic answers. And the, the truth is, this is really a, a depends situation always, because, right? yeah, and it is always right. But like, I'm listening, to you guys give tips. I'm thinking to my, I'm going through my head of like my, like my journey of like bench pressing and like, um, there were uh, very pivotal moments in in that journey where I saw leaps, right? So like one of the first leaps in my bench press was actually 
moving to high reps. I never moved to high reps. Like I literally just was changing the face. Yeah. Right. I was a kid who trained in the, you know, six reps was to build muscle. Everything that I read was around there. I wanted to get stronger. I wanted a heavier bench press. So it made sense that I was lifting these low reps to do that. Uh, but simply moving to the 12 to 15 rep range, which I thought was only for people that wanted to get lean back then, my bench press shot up. Mm -hmm. Another one was I talked about uh, uh, on the show earlier about not going past 90 degrees. I was yep. never doing anything like that. Getting really good at really deep body weight dips mm -hmm. uh, made a difference. I've talked about on the show before um, getting good at my incline bench. For many years, I neglected incline bench because I was terrible at it. And again, I just wanted to get good at a flat bench press because that's what we all compared when someone said, what do you bench? No one says what they incline bench. They say what they flat bench. And so I just wanted to get good at that. So there was a huge, huge discrepancy in my weight that I moved on incline versus flat bench. So I made it one year a goal to get just good at incline and in getting really good at incline ended up increasing my yeah. bench significantly. So it, it really does depend on what you potentially are neglecting. Now, you guys gave good tips for like sticking points, uh, added resistance with bands and chains if you've never used some of these things. But I feel like those are all things if you've already done all the stuff that I've mentioned. Like if you have if you haven't addressed your programming and, and, and if you're neglecting good exercises that really build the strength. Like if some people uh, think that they want to get a good barbell bench so they don't ever fuck with dumbbells. Yeah. It's like, I, that was another thing. That's I, a big I, I really got good at dumbbell uh, benching and that carried over into my barbell yeah, bench press. independent loads. Yeah, no, there's, there's lots of different things that we're just kind of, you know, spraying spaghetti out there. And like you pick what might make the most sense in terms of, uh, what you can apply that maybe you're neglecting within your programming or you're not addressing things. Like for me, my limitation was I would get shoulder pain. I'd get impingement. And so my shoulder wasn't tracking uh, properly. And so I had to address that mobility wise and add more rotation, add more of those uh, type of drills to add security in my shoulder, which then provided uh, more of a stable uh, situation where I could, I could load my body signaled that, Hey, everything's accounted for. So I can now apply apply more force, which was huge. And then the other, uh, you know, thing that I noticed that, uh, drove a lot more strength was focusing on leg drive. And so that was another thing that provided, uh, a lot more, uh, rigid security throughout my body. I was able to distribute more force and get my, my body more, uh, involved, uh, past just my upper body, my torso, uh, you know, including that, that leg drive and that, that tension and strength that I could summon from that, uh, increased my bench as well. You just named another one that was a big leap for me was uh, when I was introduced to like priming and understanding how important that was before going into the lift. So I too was... Uh, that's By the way, that's an easy way to add like a right rep away. on almost everybody's bench press. Right, right away. Like just getting myself into the, the proper position. So I had this tendency of the shoulders always rolling forward when I started to, you know, do like a band row or prime my upper back right before so I could hold myself in that retracted position when I go into bench that made a huge difference so i feel like there's a lot of things that you should kind of check and then sal you mentioned another huge leap for me frequency you want to get good at bench press you want to get good at anything and you only do it once a week do it two or three times minimum of a week just practice it and don't go to failure on it practice get good at that movement right so if you want to get good at the bench press strength is as much as uh, of a skill as it is your muscles contracting harder that's right so and that's what it is you're practicing the skill of the lift and you just get better at doing that lift. Justin, you mentioned leg drive. I want to emphasize that for a second because that one made zero sense to me for so long. It does to a lot of people, yeah. I like, never what? understood. I'm like, you're on a bench, you're pressing with your arms, you're doing nothing with your legs. What the hell does driving your legs into the floor and tensing up your legs have to do with the press? And people are like, oh, you're more stable. I'm like, well, I mean, I guess, but really what's going on? I don't know. Then I realized, oh, you're just your CNS fires harder when all of it fires yeah. versus when There's just an irradiation of it. effect. Yeah, so like the example I always give is if you squeeze something as hard as you could with your right hand, but had to keep everything relaxed, including your face, and then you tried that again, but allowed yourself to tense up your whole body, you'd see like a 10, 15 percent increase mm -hmm. in strength. So when you're pressing off of a bench, driving into the floor and tensing up your legs and your lower body just creates more of a central nervous system firing signal and just allows you to press more. Here's another one. 
Now, some exercises have a lot of carryover to other exercises. And so sometimes just getting good at something else, and you, didn't, you mentioned some of them, Adam, like dips and incline presses. Here's one that's not so obvious that has tremendous carry over the bench press. It's actually one of the exercises that probably, in, in my experience, again, this is general, so everybody's different, but generally speaking, has some of the best carry over the bench press. Overhead, overhead press. press. Overhead press. You, if you're stuck at your bench press, yep. sometimes, and I've had, I've done this before, where I didn't even focus on my bench, I focused on my overhead press, and then right away would see a gain. And not a bench not press. a bodybuilder military press, a full full range of motion. Yeah, down over, to the upper chest. Overhead over. press. You're right. I mean, another great one. You get good at that. I remember that. Getting good at that carried over into my bench press. So, I don't know. There's a lot of things that we just listed off, and I think the thing that you neglect the most out of all the ones that we said – I would say probably, and and by the way, even though you guys gave chains and bands first, I actually think you check the boxes and all the other oh, yeah. ones. If your before. programming sucks, that doesn't matter. Right. Like if you're not yeah. doing frequency, you're not doing the exercises that we talked about, you're not manipulating rep ranges at tempo we didn't address. Yeah, you're, or you're training there. too hard or overtraining. Yeah. Whatever. Shoulders aren't tracking properly, not yeah. stabilizing. Hit all those. And then if you've checked all those box enough consistently, then playing with cool tools, I think, like we mentioned, I think are, are you know what's funny? Value. If you're watching this right now, uh, try this. I bet you at least fifty percent of the people watching this will increase their bench press by one rep or five pounds by doing this following, and it'll happen right away. Prime your shoulders with either a prone cobra or maybe like a, a like a suspension trainer W or something like that. Right? Do some of that prime and connect, then go bench. This, it's the strangest thing. You'll all of a sudden see that small increase in strength right away. You didn't build more muscle. All you did was turn things on differently and get things to move a little bit better. So I, I, I dare everybody to try that. I bet, like I said, fifty. I would, I would bet about half of the people watching this would see their their bench press go up by you know five pounds. That was one of my Friday fitness tips, like I don't know a month or two ago. I, I agree. Next question is from Ander Beth. Are there any common situations where a caloric deficit would not result in weight loss? Yes. Now, here it is. Ready? First of all, if you're in a calorie deficit, your body is making up for those calories by burning tissue. But how can you not weight, lose weight from that happening? Gaining more water weight. This is where you may see your weight stay the same because you're holding more water even though you're losing body fat or even muscle. That being said, if you are in a deficit – your body has to make up the difference, okay? So let me explain this very simple science because I know there's people in the wellness space that deficits don't matter, and which is not true. That's so false. It's ridiculous. This is like one law, right, that you can't get around. It's literally a law of the universe where energy cannot get created nor destroyed. In other words, it gets transferred. We can't just create it out of nothing. If we did, if, shit, if there was a way to do this, we would have infinite energy and, and become like, you know, interstellar being well, or whatever. That would be awesome. Yeah, it doesn't work. So- Here's the deal. Let's say your body's burning 2,000 calories. So that's how many calories your body is burning right now, 2,000, and you take in 1,500. How did your body burn 2,000 if you only took in 1,500? It took it from itself. It burned its own tissue. Usually body fat can come from other tissues, but it's usually body fat. So if you're in a calorie deficit, you will lose tissue. Your body is taking it from itself. But if the scale doesn't go down and you're like, what's going on? And you know for sure you're in a deficit, it's water. And this one really messes people up. I can't tell you how many times it would mess up clients of mine because they come back and be like, oh my God, I gained two pounds or three pounds or I lost three pounds. I ate like a crazy over the weekend and I lost three pounds. What does this mean? Or, or vice versa. And it's like, okay, let's give it a few weeks and see if it sticks. Because uh, I don't know about you guys, but my, my body weight could fluctuate five pounds in one day. Mm -hmm. Just from water. So uh, this was something. I, so this was something I always knew, but I didn't communicate it a lot until I went through those three years of competing, and I had to track and measure, and I was so diligent about everything, so consistently, and I saw holy shit, mm. how much. So I actually got to a place where I was fluctuating nine pounds uh, uh, in the in the night. So I would go night. Now, mind you, I'm doing a gallon and a half to two gallons You're of water. You're a big dude, lots and of I'm, muscle. Yeah, 230 pounds. So that's a lot for the average person, but it is not that far off. Like three to five pounds, the average person easily can fluctuate. And that is a lot. Three to five pounds in a night, you know, north or south could really fuck somebody up. That, totally. That's, in a, that's busting their ass 
on losing weight and then they get on the scale the next morning hoping that all that hard work they did the last two days is going to show mm -hmm. and it goes up. Talk about really discouraging for somebody who's on a weight loss journey and then talk about what a terrible signal for them to be sent to then adjust what they're doing. And this is where, I, and this is why it became a mm -hmm. thing that I started to communicate a lot about right, because, because people would, they would all of a sudden change their yes, calories. Then what is that they person? They to fat. So then that person freaks out that day. They cut their calories even more. So maybe reduce it, you know, another 500 when they didn't mm -hmm. need to, they get on the treadmill now for an hour later on that day. And they, they totally send their their body a signal that they do not need to send and they just make it more difficult for themselves in the future and so you got to be careful of allowing a, a day or two of fluctuating upper and then you add in things too like a, when uh you know if you're on your period that's going to change it's you add in a day where you just drank a little more water you add in a day where you had saltier foods so you had higher sodium intake mm -hmm. like all these things can make a difference on how much water you stress you have a stressful day at work so your body starts to yep. retain a little bit more water so all these factors can manipulate how much water your body ends up holding in a day or not or not releasing and a lot of times people allow that to dictate what they do uh, nutritionally and exercise wise and then they just make it worse for themselves yeah, this is the number one reason why extremely low carb diets uh became so popular it, it, it was not the only reason but it's the number one reason because you see very fast initial weight gain with a low-carb diet. You don't retain diet. quite as much water uh, yeah, when you take the carbs. Oh, it's right a away. Lot. Every three grams of, of carbs that you intake, your body holds on to three ounces of water. Yeah. So you take somebody who's eating three, 400 grams of carbs every single day and do the math. That's you know, how many ounces of water their body is not holding on oh, to I'll, now. I'll lose, I'll easily, if I cut my car, and I don't eat a lot of carbs anyway, but if I cut my carbs, I'll easily lose eight pounds within a week on mm -hmm. the scale, but I yeah. know it's, it's water. I'm not burning eight pounds of body fat uh, in a week. So definitely, it's definitely important to consider that. But again, deficit or surplus me, by the way, when people say it doesn't matter, either A, they're, they're totally negligent, ignorant and idiots, or B, they're confusing uh, what may be happening. Cause yes, you can, you can adjust, you can change how many calories your body burns, which then makes it no longer a deficit or no longer a surplus. And then they'll come across and be like, no, calorie surplus or deficit doesn't matter because I ate the deficit. And I didn't, I haven't lost any weight. Well, your body adjusted its burn. So again, the deficit or the surplus that ultimately it will make or break whether or not you gain or lose weight. So what you're saying is we can't create energy from nothing until we get a tesseract. <laughs> yeah, totally. Okay. Next question is from Matthew Garcia. What are the best body weight exercises to build a stronger core and when to program them? You know what I'm going to do right now? I'm going to give my favorite advanced core exercise. This is advanced, so you need to be really strong and have good stability, but I'm going to give one of my favorites away. This was an exercise I saw Bruce Lee doing Dragonflies. back in the day yes <laughs> and then so bruce lee was i was like a huge bruce lee fan when yeah. i was a kid i mean enter the dragon return to the dragon um you know return of the dragon excuse me chinese connection like great i loved him and he was really muscular for that era and he did all these extra stuff. he did dragon flags which were really cool and then here's what solidified it rocky did it in rocky four that's the one where they're doing the montage where he's getting ready for the russian and he's doing them on the thing yeah. like that. Anyway, that exercise, it, you know, if you're strong enough and, and and have the right stability, nothing builds my core. Like literally, I, I'll do seven reps of that and nothing will build. There's a picture of. of and there's lots. Doing. So most people won't be able to do this. No, but there's yeah, actually yeah. you like could do like a lever. regression to this. Like there's regressions that you can do, like a re, almost like a a reverse crunch yes. to a lifting your hips off. So your the, knees are just slightly bent. And yeah, you can kind of yeah. Fold. Yeah. Or you could even do like where your legs are straight, but you know what I'm saying, right? Where you're you kind of roll the spine up yes. and then keep your legs instead straight. of maintaining that. Yeah, kind instead of, of maintaining it, like the dragonfly is really advanced, but there's definitely variations of this to to progress you to get here totally. that the average person could actually do. That I agree have tremendous value. Yeah, now I'm going to back out and I'll give you my some uh, of my favorite uh, one of my favorite basic exercises. Mm -hmm. I love reverse crunches. It's one of my favorite exercises. I would yeah. have clients often start with it because it was harder to turn into a reverse crunch into a hip flexor sit up than a forward sitting crunch or sit up. 
So I'd have people lay on the floor or on a bench. They would anchor their upper body, bend their knees, tuck their knees so everything's kind of nice and tight, and then just roll their pelvis yeah. backwards off the bench. And it's a great way to really work the, the you know the muscles of the core. I like is a simple exercise, the perfect sit up, and yeah. just because I can, you know, you can sort of highlight the connectivity between like each one of your abs and like really focusing on bringing that sternum down towards your belly button and, and getting that, you know, that sensation and that crunch and feeling uh, there in the core and really isolating it. And then uh, another one, um, well, I I was going to bring up levers like for like an extreme version of what you're talking about with the dragon flags, but you can do that with a, with a uh, pull-up bar uh, and, and sort of work your way up with that. Again, to your point, you can bend your knees and you can kind of slowly, it's more of an eccentric type of a move where you're really stabilizing your entire body. The other one that's really uh, a lot more simple than that is the hollow body position. And that's uh, basically like a lot of people do planks and they're familiar with planks and that isometric position in terms of like stabilizing uh, the spine, getting your core activated. Well, you know, flipping on your back. So now your legs are just slightly up. Uh, uh, your, your toes are pointed, your arms are behind your head, and your, your fingers are pointed. It just helps to kind of connect the entire body at once. So if I, can, if I have that ability, that translates so well to basically any position I put you in. So perfect sit-up was the one I was going to say, and, and I just think that that lays the foundation for like every other ab exercise you're going to do that having the ability to articulate your spine like that slow and controlled not only is it extremely challenging but it's so beneficial to yeah. everything else the other one that i'd add in there because uh, and i thought for sure you would, you were going to steal both from me justin is to i like a, a cable wood chop yeah you know oh yeah of i course. just because you can load it quite a bit um, very functional the, yeah the rotational strength unit the anti-rotational strength that comes from it very functional i just there's and rotation is rarely ever trained just, in core workouts so those would go yeah, those would so be important. like my my two favorite or i like what you did with the dragonfly or like a regression of that like those and then where do you program it was the rest of this question well uh typically um either on a day it's on its own or at the end of a workout and here's why um, now, I know if you have a weak body part, it's important to prioritize that body part and work it first in a workout. The problem with the core and doing that with the core is you re it, you need it to be stable for almost everything that you do. It's not a great idea to start a workout with core, fatigue your core, then you go on to work out your legs or your back or upper body and uh, the risk of injuries tends to go up. So typically at the end of the workout, two or three days a week, maybe six sets uh, for core. I would incorporate some rotation. Don't neglect rotation. Um, and some kind of a, you know, rolling forward or rolling back extra. Physio ball crunches are another really good one. You got to do them right though. Um, active planks is another really good exercise. But something that targets the the abs so that you're bringing the rib cage and the pelvis closer together. So that's any movement that does that. So that could be a crunch, a reverse crunch. It could be a perfect sit-up. And then something with rotation and the cable chop is a great, or bands, you know, that rotation is so important. And if you watch people's core workouts, they almost never include rotation either A, because it's not a popular way to train your core or B, because they're misinformed and say, and they think, oh, if I work my obliques, I'm going to get a bigger yeah, waist. God forbid. Yeah. So stupid. That's so dumb. Please train your obliques like you train any other muscle. They're very important. And the stronger and more defined your obliques are, the better your core will look. Next question is from Nate B. How do I increase compliance with my clients? Oh, yeah. This is a, You know what's funny? Mm. Of all the questions I get from trainers- Don't learn from the government. Beat them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. This has to be one of the more common ones. It, you know, versions of this, right? Like, how do I get my clients to do- you know, what I tell them, how do I get my clients to eat better? How do I get my clients to show up more at the gym? Okay, so here's what I would have said to you 15 years ago. Here, what I would have said is you have to inspire them. You have to motivate them. You have to, you know, really present the case really well. Get them to do what you want. Call them every day. Hey, buddy, you know who it is. We planned this. You were supposed to be here with me. Yeah, I'm right here. Come find me. And then I realized that that was a terrible strategy because although if you're good, and I was great, so I, one thing I'll say is I can sell an idea very, very well. This is something that I've always been able, able to do pretty well. So I could get my clients to buy in right away, and I was really good at this. But I would get them to buy in with inspiration, motivation, 
that would wane wet either because they weren't working with me anymore or because it wanes because that's just what happens. And then they would stop. And I realized this is a failing strategy. I can motivate them all day long. It's not going to last forever. My goal is to get this person to do things forever. So what I started to do was meet them where they were at. Mm -hmm. And I would inform them. I would support them. And whatever they could commit to, I would do the best job of providing the best service and value. And then what would happen was magical. They would slowly improve their compliance on their own. Some people it would take a year or two. Other people it would take a few months. But I had so much success by telling my clients, here's what, okay, here's what'll get you where you want to go. Oh, you want to start there? That's no problem. We could do a lot with that. And then I would be that guy. I'd train them, support them. I'd be honest with them. Oh my God, why am I not losing weight? So, well, it's because the diet part. I'd be honest with them, but I wouldn't force them. I wouldn't sit there and try and, you know, you know, inspire and motivate them and drive them to do what I wanted. And then little by little, they'd come to me and be like, hey, Sal, I want to do this thing with my nutrition. Hey, Sal, I'd like to show up to another workout. Or, hey, I've been doing this other exercise on my own. And little by little, these people magically did all the right stuff, took a little longer, but it stuck. It stuck forever. Well, isn't the difficulty in the beginning is that um, you're reliant a lot of times because of your business model of bringing them into the gym. And so it's like this urgency and this hustle to have them in front of you, have control. A lot of it is is a control issue, I think, that a lot of con- like personal trainers have in terms of um, like, like even this word compliance, like it's, it's this assumption that, um, they're going to be doing all these things that you're telling them and, and you're the, you're, you're the biggest, um, part of the, the, the piece in, in this entire puzzle of them moving forward. And, uh, it took me a long time to pull myself out of that entire equation, uh, and to do what you're talking, you're talking about in terms of like providing the right kind of information, uh, being available constantly, making sure they know that they can rely on me. But guess what? If you don't show up, it's completely on you. And I actually like flipped my business model on its head. So that way they were in that same understanding that uh, they know that I'm going to be there. I'm going to be professional. I'm going to take them through when they're ready, wherever they're at, um, you know, what they're willing to um, commit to. Uh, I'm definitely going to be there if they don't show up. You know, that's something they have to wrestle with themselves. This is their journey. This is this is entirely their process. I just want to keep reassuring them. I'm going to be here. I have the the tools for you uh, to get through this. You know, on the other side is basically you know be, instead of like being there casting um, uh, you know the the fishing rod for them. Like I'm teaching them how to fish and, and do this all themselves, and then removing myself. Way more successful. Yeah, oh, I'm going to piggyback off of what Sal said, but probably say it a little bit different. Um, than the meeting them where they're at type of deal is anytime you you learn something new whether it be a sport or a new habit or behavior it's like part of what makes people want to keep doing that is the experience that they have from it and normally if it's a positive experience that they have they're more likely to come back and do it again like if you go play a sport for the first time and you get your ass handed to you or you don't like it it's a miserable experience you fail at it you fail at it it's really tough to get up and want to do that again That's the same thing when it comes to working out. And so what I want to do is I want to create a ton of small wins. So it's kind of like the same thing that you're talking about. So, but when I set these goals, I'm going to set things that I know that they can get, they can accomplish. So we can just start adding up all these little wins. So to to give them momentum and to encourage them to want to do more and comply to more things that I'm going to throw their way. If you lay something out and it's this super complex, hard, tons of workouts, tons of diet and calorie stuff to follow. Like, and you give them all, there's a small percentage of people that, okay, they get that. And like maybe the engineer mind that really likes that. And they're like, okay, I got all the details. I know exactly what to do. That's not most people. Mm. Most people are not like that. They, most people look at that and go like, oh, it's like sitting down with a kid trying to teach them football for the first time. And you're teaching them all these defensive schemes, all these different stances, how to throw those, this, and how to do, and like, you're teaching them like 50 things at once. And you're like, oh my God, this is overwhelming. It's like literally give them one thing, one goal you're going to give them right now that you know is an an easy win that they can accomplish either that day or the next day or within that first week, and then you build upon that. And what you'll see is if you can build that momentum, you'll see the compliance start to go up versus trying to throw everything at them at once. It's it's 100%. And 
when I pieced it together, I mean, I had a client once that I remember when she showed up, she was referred to me by one of my other clients that was a doctor. And she came in and literally, these were the first words out of her mouth. I introduced myself and she said, I don't like to work out. I'm here because Dr. So-and-so has told me numerous times I got to come see you. I'm only going to work with you once a week. I'm not going to do anything on my own and I'm, and I'm not changing my diet. Those were the first things out of her mouth when she met me. Old trainer Sal would have blown her out the door. Well, you're not going to do what I say. You're not serious, whatever. Instead, I said, no problem. There's a lot we could do with one day a week. Definitely more than what you're doing now, which is zero. And she looked at me like, really? I can only have to, I only have to come once a week? I said, yeah, absolutely. If you're not working out at all now with once a week, there's a lot of stuff that we can do together. Now, here's the key. Here's the, the interesting part about this story. After about two years or through the course of two years, this woman met with me two more days a week, started working out on her own, started working on her nutrition, became a certified personal trainer. This was over the course of two years because I met her where she was and I provided her a ton of value. It also reminds me of, I have a family member who was very talented at soccer when he was a kid, but his dad was a very high level soccer player in Italy. So when he was a kid, his dad was like, super soccer coach. No, you got to do it this way. You got to do it that way. And he'd bring him to all these games and he just overbearing. Well, this family member of mine hated soccer because of it and quit when he was 12. Later on at the age of 30, he looks back and he goes, man, if my dad was cool about it, he goes, I would have been playing. So he's like, I would have gone to college and had a scholarship and I would have loved it because, but he made it such a shitty experience <laughs> that I ended up quitting. Mm -hmm. Now he's a dad himself and he's different uh, with his kids. So think of it that way. By the way, the advice that we're giving to the coach right now works when you coach yourself. Okay, here's this is the, the, the important part of this. When you're trying to coach yourself and get yourself to do this new thing, okay, it's the same thing. Say to yourself, what is a small, challenging, yet realistic step that I can take right now or in a state of mind that is not motivated? I'm going to start there. Do that and then watch the natural progression happen from there. If you do everything all at once, your chances of long-term success are less than 10%. That's statistically true. So less than 10%. So whatever advice we're giving to this trainer right now, apply it to yourself for better uh, long-term odds of success. Look, if you like our information, you got to head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out all of our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost all of your fitness, nutrition, and health goals. You can also find all of us on Instagram. So Justin is at Mind Pump Justin. I'm at Mind Pump Sal and Adam is at Mind Pump Adam.